Uh, thank you, Rafi, for that um, excellent introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pushkin Club. Uh, the 26th of August, uh, 2021, will be the 100th anniversary of the tragic death of Nikolai Gumilyov. The Pushkin Club is commemorating that date by devoting this evening uh, to a celebration of the life and work of Gumilyov, who is one of the most significant uh, Russian poets of the 20th century. Throughout his short life of 35 years, uh, Nikolai Gumilyov loved to travel. He visited Egypt, Abyssinia, Somalia, and many other countries. He twice visited London for short periods. When he returned uh, to Bolshevik Russia at the end of his second visit in April 1918, he left behind various papers which came to be known as Gumilyov's London Archive. One of the papers in this archive was a mysterious diagram which related the names of 12 Roman gods to four social castes. These four castes, which were derived from Hindu tradition, were warrior, merchant, clerk, and pariah, voyen, kupiets, clerk, iparia. The various intersections uh, between these groupings, warrior, merchant, merchant, clerk, etc., were intended as a framework for the classification by type of Russian poets, poets and perhaps uh, poets in general. Uh, thus, Lermontov appears as warrior Clark. Bloch, on the other hand, appears as Clark Pariah. The names of the further 12 Russian poets were listed, including Gumilyov himself. Regrettably, these poets were left unclassified. However, Gleb Struva, who first published the papers from Gumilyov's London archive, has speculated that Gumilyov would have put himself in the same category as Lermontov. That is to say, that of Warrior Clark. In the course of this evening, I hope to be able to illustrate this description of Gumilyov by reference to both his life and his work. I will also show how Gumilyov was one of the founding members of the Acmeist poetry movement and describe the part he played in the brilliant flowering of Russian culture known as the Silver Age from approximately 1895 to 1915. Uh, from his very first collection of thus, The Path of the Conquistadors, Put uh, Conquistadorov, uh, which was published in 1905, Gumilyov himself did much to project the image of poet warrior. Indeed, he once said that he was a traveler, a soldier, and a poet in that order. I'd also like to draw some comparisons between Lermontov and Gumilyov. Some of the parallels between the two poets are indeed so close as to be uncanny. They both saw active service on the battlefield, both engaged in dueling, and both had a clear presentiment of their own death. Gumilyov died at the age of 35, uh, one of the first writers to die at the hands of the Bolsheviks. He packed an amazing amount of life into those 35 years and produced a corpus of work that stands comparison with the best Russian poets. It's fair to say that Gumilyov fulfilled the famous lines of Pushkin from the prophet. Arise, prophet, sense and see, and crossing land and sea, set aflame the hearts of people with your word. Nikolai Stepanovich Gumilyov was born on the naval base of Kronstadt on the 3rd of April 1886 into the noble family of a Kronstadt ship's doctor, Stepan Yakovlevich Gumilyov. His mother was Anna Ivanovna Lvova. Uh, this slide uh, shows um, Gumilyov's parents. And the next uh, slide shows his parents uh, with Dmitri, who was two years older uh, than Nikolai, uh, 
Dmitry Micha is on the left in that uh, third picture on the right hand side, and then uh, Kolya uh, Nikolai is on the extreme right. Um, before Nikolai's first birthday, his father retired uh, from the Russian Imperial Navy, and the Gumilyovs moved to the Petersburg suburb of Tsarskoye Selo. Tsarskoye became the future poet's main home until the revolution. From an early age, Gumilyov's mother, uh, to whom he remained close all his life, had encouraged in him a love of reading, and his father had encouraged his love of adventure. Because of poor health, he was educated almost entirely at home until the age of 10. The family then moved uh, to St. Petersburg, where he was enrolled in the Gurievich Gymnasium, or grammar school. Uh, this had a fine reputation and generally enlightened teachers. Uh, the young Gumilyov, though, showed little enthusiasm for lessons. Uh, but he developed an early love of literature. By the time he was 13, this was in 1899, this already included the Russian poets and, in translation, Milton and Coleridge, as well as Shakespeare. Uh, the following year, 1900, brought a dramatic change of routine, probably because of the ill health of Gumilyov's elder brother, uh, Dmitry, the family moved uh, to Tiflis, uh, present day Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. This was a picturesque and exotic place with another excellent uh, Russian gymnasium where Gumilyov studied more successfully than before. The family returned to Sarsko Selo in the autumn of 1903. It was at this point that Gumilyov discovered the German philosopher Nietzsche and the symbolists and became increasingly convinced of his own vocation as a poet. A more personal influence was in Akienti Anensky, the headmaster of his new school, the Tsarskoye Selo Boys Gymnasium. Gumilyov again made poor academic progress. He had to repeat a year because of his failure in mathematics and did not leave school until he was 20. But he fell under the poetic and ideological sway of Anensky, who happened also to be a first-rate poet. This influence continued after Gumilyov left school until Anensky's sudden death from a heart attack in 1909. Gumilyov later admitted that it was Anensky's influence that had turned his mind to writing poetry. Subsequently, he proclaimed Anensky to be the inspirational precursor of the Acmeists. Another encounter in Sarsko et Silo at the end of 1903 had a still greater impact. This was his first meeting at the age of 17 with the 14-year-old schoolgirl Anya Gorenka, who later assumed the pen name of Akhmatova. Gumilyov fell deeply in love with Akhmatova and by May 1904 had declared his love for her. There followed an agonizing and lengthy courtship. He twice proposed marriage and was twice turned down before Akhmatova eventually agreed to marry him. Nikolai Gumilyov's first book of verse was The Path of the Conquistadors, Puj Conquistador, which was published at his parents' expense in October 1905. The poems of this collection are firmly rooted in the mainstream of Russian symbolism, the leading poetry movement of that time. We're going to read one of the poems uh, from this collection, Choice, Bibur. In this poem, Gumilyov writes, that whatever route we choose to take in life, no mortal can escape their ordained fate. However, the poet declares that each of us has the incomparable right to choose our own death. Some commentators have suggested 
that the poem gives expression to that presentiment of his own violent death which haunted Gumilyov throughout his life. We'll now read Choice. The builder of the tower will hurtle to the ground. His headlong flight will be terrifying. And in the depths of the well, he will curse his folly. The destroyer will be crushed, flattened by the debris, and abandoned by all seeing God, he will cry out at his suffering. And he who will go into dark caverns or down the creek of a quiet river will come face to face with the terrifying pupils of a ferocious panther. You cannot escape the bloody fate which heaven has ordained for us all. But be silent. You have the incomparable right to choose your own death. Выбор. Созидающий башню сорвется. Будет страшен стремительный лед. И на дне мирового колодца он безумие свое проклянет. Разрушающий будет раздавлен, опрокинут обломками плит, и всевидящим Богом оставлен, он о муке своей возопит, а ушедший в ночные пещеры или к заводам тихой реки повстречает свирепой пантерой наводящие ужас зрачки. Не спасешься от доли кровавой, что земным предназначено, предназначила твердь. Но молчи, несравненное право самому выбирать свою смерть. Gumilyov had sent a copy of Fut uh, Konkristadorov to Valery Brusov, a prominent uh, symbolist poet and editor of the most important symbolist journal, The Scales, we a, a, a brief and rather lukewarm review uh, duly appeared there. It was followed three months later by a letter from Brusov, which led to a lengthy period of dedicated apprenticeship by Gumilyov to the older poet. Brusov uh, proved himself the ideal mentor. His influence was apparent in his pupil's next volume, Romantic Flowers, Ramantitiski Tsveti, uh, published at Gumilyov's own expense in 1908. We will now read the exquisite poem, Giraffe, uh, from that collection. Today, I see you look especially sad. Your arms embracing your knees are especially thin. Listen, far, far away, round Lake Chad, wanders an elegant giraffe. He is graceful, shapely and languid. Divine gifts a magical pattern for his skin that only the moon dares to compete with, its reflection breaking on the surface of broad lakes. From afar, he's like the coloured sails of a ship. His running flows like a joyful bird's flight. I know that the earth sees much to marvel at when he hides in a marble grotto at sunset. I know the happy tales of mysterious lands, about the black maiden, the young chief's passion. But you breathed in the heavy mist for too long. You will not believe in anything except rain. And how can I tell you of the tropical garden, of the slender palms, of the smell of undreamed of herbs? 
you are crying. Listen. Far away, round Lake Chad, wanders an elegant giraffe. Жираф. Сегодня я вижу особенно грустен твой взгляд. И руки особенно тонки, колени обняв. Послушай, далеко-далеко на озере Чад изысканный бродит жираф. Ему грациозная стройность и нега дана. И шкуру его украшает волшебный узор, с которым равняться осмелится только луна, дробясь и качаясь на влаге широких озер. Вдали он подобен цветным парусам корабля, и бег его плавен, как радостный птичий полет. Я знаю, что много чудесного видит земля, когда на закате он прячется в мраморный грот. Я знаю веселые сказки таинственных стран про черную деву, про страсть молодого вождя. Но ты слишком долго Вдыхала тяжелый туман. Ты верить не хочешь во что-нибудь, кроме дождя. И как я тебе расскажу про тропический сад, про стройные пальмы, про запах немыслимых трав? Ты плачешь, послушай, далеко. На озере Чад изысканный бродит жираф. In 1906, following Akhmatova's rejection of him at that point, uh, Gumilyov chose to abandon Russia. That autumn, he left for Paris with little money and against um, his parents' wishes on the pretext of study at the Sorbonne. He seems to have been far from assiduous in attending lectures on art and medieval French literature, but he evidently read a lot and worked hard at his writing. With two Russian associates, Gumilyov produced a short-lived literary and artistic periodical, uh, Sirius, in which Anna Akhmatova made her poetic debut. Gumilyov also tried to widen his circle of literary acquaintances among the many Russian intellectuals who frequented the French capital. Unfortunately, the most prominent of these, Dmitry Merezhkovsky and his wife Zinaida Gipios, were not very encouraging. Indeed, he was effectively snubbed by Gipios, a rebuff which he resented for the rest of his life. The overriding impression of his uh, Parisian period is one of deep solitude, depression, and misery. All these resulted in an attempted suicide, and then a restlessness which led to his arrest for vagrancy in Normandy. Against such a background, literary progress might have seemed impossible. However, with Brusov's help, uh, Gumilyov gradually began to publish his works in, in several prominent periodicals, and the older poet's favorable reaction to romantic flowers gave him the confidence uh, to return permanently to Russia in the spring of 1908. In 1909, uh, Gumilyov initiated a series of seminars on poetry under the guidance of Yatislav Ivanov, the erudite Petersburg symbolist poet. He and Akhmatova began to frequent, uh, to frequent Ivanov's famous uh, bohemian intellectual tower, Bashnia, which was actually the nickname of Ivanov's flat. These meetings eventually led to uh, Gumilyov's creative emancipation from the influences of other poets. At this point, Gumilyov 
was still only 23. Akhmatova later regarded the opposition which the still young Gumilyov mounted to Vyacheslav Ivanov's formidable uh, personal and intellectual authority as an act of, quote, civic courage. However, he also, he also sought out other, more physical forms of danger. A notorious example was the bizarre event which took place in the literary life of St. Petersburg in November 1909. This was Gumilyov's duel with the poet Maximilian Voloshin. The tangled pretext was the creation of a fictional Catholic poetess, Juan Cherubina de Gabriac, by Voloshin and Elisaveta Dmitrieva. Gumilyov had an affair with Elisaveta Dmitrieva and even proposed but she had switched her affections in the summer of 1909 from him to Voloshin. In the autumn of 1909, the identity of Cherubina as Elisaveta Dmitrieva was revealed in the press and Gumilyov made some unflattering remarks about Elisaveta. Voloshin then slapped his face in public and Gumilyov challenged him. After the event, the duelists, each of the duelists was fined uh, 10 rubles and the quotes duel of the decadence elicited a series of sardonic reports in the popular press. This contemporary amusement of the duelist expense is not hard to understand. By the beginning of the, 90, of the 20th century, uh, dueling was manifestly anachronistic. And though other Russian men of letters were later to issue challenges, uh, Gumilyov and Voloshin were certainly among the last to fight. The literary theatrical element, moreover, was emphatic throughout. The duel took place at Chornaya Riechka, the site both of Pushkin's duel with Dantes and of Lermontov's with de Barant. And Gumilyov set out for the encounter from the editorial offices of the magazine Apollo. The address was Moika 24. This was in striking proximity to the apartment at Moika 12, from which Pushkin had set out to fight with Dantes. One notable difference uh, from the 19th century was that Gumilyov, together with his seconds, set out for the duel by taxi. The outcome of the duel might well have been tragic had Voloshin II uh, not tampered with his gun, which twice misfired. Uh, Gumilyov himself fired into the air. This episode in November 1909 shows how turbulent Gumilyov's personal life was at this time. But despite long separations and Gumilyov's occasional pursuit of other women, Akhmatova continued to be his ideal. He was driven to such despair by her seeming indifference that he twice attempted suicide. It may be that Armatova eventually chose to accept him more from a mixture of respect and compassion for his sheer persistency than out of any unhesitating love on her part. At last, in April 1910, the couple married to the unanimous dis disapproval of Akhmatova's relatives. Not surprisingly, their marriage was happy only for a short time. Akhmatova herself re later realized that her marriage to Gumilyov was not the beginning, but the beginning of the end of their relationship. Their son Lev, uh, Lyova, who was born on the 18th of September, 1912, was raised by Gumilyov's mother, Anna Ivanovna. On the level of everyday life, in which neither partner was particularly skilled, they soon drifted apart. On another level, however, of poetry and spiritual concerns, they remained very close. And the poetic dialogue between the two never came to a halt. The image of Akhmatova haunted Gumilyov's writing throughout his career. 
A good illustration of this is his poem, From a Dragon's Lair. Is Logova Zmiva, is Gorada Kieva. This was written in 1911, within a year of his marriage to Akhmatova, and appeared in the collection Alien Sky, uh, Chujo and Nieba, which was published in uh, 1912. Following her parents' separation, um, Akhmatova had lived with her mother uh, principally in Kiev. The poem draws on Ukrainian folklore demonology. We will now read From a Dragon's Lair. From a dragon's lair, from the town of Kiev, I took not a wife, but a witch. I thought she'll be fun and guessed she'll be capricious, a happy bird of song. You call her, she frowns. You embrace her, she bristles. And when the moon comes out, she pines. And she looks and groans as though she is burying someone and wants to drown herself. I repeat to her, the Lord knows I haven't got the wizardry or time to fuss with you. Take your lassitude off to the depths of the Dnieper and to the sinful bald mountain. She is silent, just hunches up and is always unwell. I pity her, the guilty one, like a wounded bird, a blasted birch over the bog, touched by God. Из логова змеева, из города Киева, я взял себе в жены колдуни. Я думал забавницу, гадал свою нравницу, веселую птицу певунью. Покликаешь, морщится, обнимешь, топорщится, а выйдет луна, затомится и смотрит, и стонет, как будто хоронит кого-то и хочет топиться. Твержу ей крещеному, с тобой помудренному возиться теперь мне не в пору. Снеси-ка из тому ты в днепровские омуты на грешную лысую гору. Молчит, только ежится, и все ей не можется. Мне жалко ее виноватую, как птицу подбитую, березу подрытую, над очистью Богом заклятую. As for Gumilyov's uh, poetic development, in 1910, he produced his third book, uh, Pearls, Jemchuga, which was uh, brought out by Brusov's Scorpion, Scorpio Publishing House. Uh, Gumilyov continued to move away from the influence of the symbolists to broaden his range of literary and cultural reference, and in effect, to find his own poetic voice. In Pearls, and in his next book, Alien Sky, uh, Chujo and Nieba, in 1912, one can already detect some of the features of acmeism in the respect shown for the literary heritage and tradition and in the values of self-discipline and craftsmanship. A good example is the poem Captains from the Pearls collection. It displays some of the characteristic features of acmeism very specific and concrete details, graphic images, and intense physicality. Thus, in Captains, we see the sea captain marking his bold course with a needle on a tattered map, slashing, uh, flecks of foam, slashing off uh, flecks of foam from his boots with blows of his cane, and whipping out a pistol from his belt to quell a mutiny, with the result that gold dust spills out from his cuffs 
of pinkish Brabant lace. We'll now read Captains. On Arctic and Southern seas, over the hummocks of the green swell, between basalt and pearly reefs, the sails of ships rustle. Discoverers of new lands, the captains command the, shift, the, the swift winged ships. Maelstroms and shallows have they known. Hurricanes hold no terrors for them. The captain's lungs were saturated, not with the dust of lost charts, but with sea salt. He marks his bold course with a needle on a tattered map. And going out onto the shuddering bridge, remembers the port he has left. Slashing off the flecks of foam from his sea boots with blows of his cane, or uncovering a mutiny on board, whips out a pistol from his belt, so that gold spills from his cuffs of pinkish Brabant lace. Let the sea go berserk and lash. The crests of the waves rise to the heavens. Not one of them trembles before the storm. Not one reefs his sails. Are cowards given these hands, this sharp, confident eye, that can suddenly hurl a frigate against enemy feluccas, pierce giant whales with a well-aimed bullet or steel harpoon, and make out in the star-filled night the protective beam of lighthouses? Капитаны, на полярных морях и на южных, по изгибам зеленых зыбей, меж базальтовых скал и жемчужных шелестят паруса кораблей. Быстрокрылых ведут капитаны, открыватели новых земель. Для кого не страшны ураганы, Кто изведал мальстрёмы и мель, Чья не пылью затерянных хартий, Солью моря пропитана грудь, Кто иглой на изорванной карте Отмечает свой дерзостный путь. И, взойдя на трепещущий мостик, Вспоминает покинутый порт, Отряхая ударами трости Клочья пены с высоких ботфорт. Или бунт, на борту обнаружив, Из-за пояса рвет пистолет, Так что сыпется золото с кружев С розоватых брабанских манжет. Пусть безумствует море и хлещет, Гребни волн поднялись в небеса, Ни один пред грозой не трепещет, Ни один не свернет паруса. Разве трусом даны эти руки Этот острый, уверенный взгляд? Что умеет на вражьи филуки Неожиданно бросить фрегат Меткой пулей, острогой железной Настигать исполинских китов И приметить в ночи многозвездный Охранительный свет маяков. From his home in Sarsko Selo, uh, Gumilyov now sought active involvement in Petersburg literary life. However, throughout his life, Gumilyov showed himself ready to abandon the literary scene and perhaps the banalities and emotional complexities of domestic life by dis disappearing for long periods on his uh, foreign travels. At the end of 1909, he left on a four month journey to Abyssinia, uh, but failed to reach the capital, Addis Ababa. In autumn 1910, 
only four months after honeymooning in Paris, he abandoned his wife for a longer six month expedition. I'll show two slides uh, from his uh, trips to Africa. Uh, this time he went via Constantinople, uh, Port Said and the Nile and reached Addis Ababa inland through desert and mountains from Djibouti. The three journeys he made to Africa were physically arduous and hazardous. He made friends with Abyssinian poets and artists, met Emperor Menelik II, and collected folk songs, paintings, and everyday utensils. He returned to Russia with tropical fever and an apparent disenchantment with travel. But in the spring of 1913, only four months after the inception of the new poetry movement, Acmeism, and seven months since the birth of his son, Liev, he left for the third time for Abyssinia and Somalia. During this visit, he met the future emperor, Haile Selassie I, and took a photograph of him. The third and final expedition to Abyssinia in 1913 was sponsored and financed, albeit modestly, by the Academy of Sciences. Uh, he and his nephew, Nikolai Sverchkov, brought back a rich and varied collection of African artifacts. This was prescribed for a long time, like Gumilyov's writings, uh, but is now housed in the, in the St. Petersburg Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography. Gumilyov's travels in Africa inspired many fine poems, which were published in his books, Pearls, Alien Squ uh, Sky, The Quiver, Bonfire, and The Tent. Gumilyov also traveled in Europe. In 1912, he and Ahmatova toured Italy together. This led to a series of poems on Italian cities. Between these foreign trips, Gumilyov continued to energetically pursue his literary activities. He became involved with Sergei Makovsky's new journal, Apollon, Apollo, which later became a forum for Acmeist opposition to symbolism. His regular letters on Russian poetry were models of well-written and perceptive literary criticism. And in uh, November 1911, with other young colleagues, Gumilyov founded the Poets Guild, Siech Paetov, in opposition to Vyacheslav Ivanov's gatherings in the tower. He and Sergei Gorodetsky were the self-appointed masters of the guild with Anna Akhmatova as secretary. Osip Mandelstam soon became, in Akhmatova's phrase, Pievaya Skripka, first violin. By the end of 1912, Gumilyov and the other founder members were ready to announce the advent of Acmeism. In January 1913, Gumilyov and Gorodetsky published their Acmeist manifestos in the journal Apollo. Gumilyov's manifesto was entitled The Legacy of Symbolism and Acmeism. This established Gumilyov as the effective leader of the new Acmeist movement in Russian poetry. It also coincided with a period of extraordinary vitality and creativity in Russian culture, in painting, music and ballet, as well as literature. And Gumilyov's mature creative uh, period as a poet became part of the brilliant flowering of Russian culture uh, in the period known as the, as the Silver Age, Serebrini Viek, which lasted roughly uh, from 1895 to 1915. It's called the Silver Age, as I'm sure you all know, by way of contrast with the Golden Age of Russian literature of the 19th century. During the period of the Silver Age from 1895 to 1915, or arguably until the 1930s, other arts as well as poetry were in an extremely vibrant state. Chagall and Vrubel were emerging as painters, as were Malievich, Kandinsky, Larionov 
and Goncharova, Skriabin, Rachmaninoff, Prokofiev, and Stravinsky were revolutionizing music. Stanislav, Stanislavski and Meyerhold were developing new methods in theatrical production. Yagilev, Anna Pavlova, Tamara Kasavina, and Václav Nijinsky were transforming classical Russian ballet in the most exciting way. And Liev Vaxt and Alexander Benoit were painting, illustrating books, and designing costumes and scenery for ballet and theater. There was a remarkable intensity about it all, as if the participants foresaw that their creativity was soon to be stifled by the impending Soviet dictatorship or through being scattered into foreign exile. The great achievement of the Russian novelists in the age of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and Turgenev had not been matched by the Russian poets who were their contemporaries. Most of them wrote, uh, quotes, civic poetry in a style that Mandelstam described as of an almost wooden simplicity. In the 1890s, the prevalent civic virtue theories were challenged by the symbolist poets. They succeeded in freeing Russian poetry from what Gumenev called its previous narrow prison of ideology and prejudice. The symbolists also influenced painting music and other arts. And they brought Russia into contact with European literary movements represented elsewhere by Baudelaire, Mallarmé, Stefan George, Rilke, and Yeats. The symbolists, Bieli, Vyacheslav Ivanov, and to some extent Bloch, had come to think of poetry as essentially religious, mystical, and metaphysical. The acmeists the group with which Gumilov is identified had different ideas. Acmeism first and foremost involved the three great poets, Akhmatova, Mandelstam, and Gumilov. The movement seemed to unite these three poets even beyond the grave. Mandelstam, for example, wrote to Akhmatova on the seventh anniversary of Gumilov's death in 1928 of the imaginary dialogue he continued to conduct with Kolya without interruption or foreseeable end. The Akhmias movement was conceived in deliberate opposition to the long-standing dominance of Russian symbolism, which the participants believed had lost its way in the fog of its own mysticism and high-flown metaphysical abstractions. Uh, Gumilyov defined Akhmiasm etymologically by reference to its Greek root, Acme, as the highest point of something, the flowering or time of fluorescence. Years later, when Mandelstam was pressed uh, to define acmeism by a hostile audience, he defined it as a yearning for world co culture, tasca for miravoi culturie. Gumilyov claimed that the acmeists were the true heirs of symbolism, preserving the best of the older movement. He declared that symbolism has been a worthy father. Symbolism bil haroshim atsom. The sun, however, was quite different. The Acmeus shared the commitment to Western European culture, traditionally associated with St. Petersburg, and emphasized this commitment in the title of the journal Apollo, with its classical connotations. The Acmeus approach to poetic subjects will tend to be multifaceted, multi-layered, and multi-dimensional. A good illustration of this approach, in Gumilyov's case, is his poem, Sixth Sense, which we're now going to read. There is beauty in the wine that loves us, and the good bread which is in the oven, and the woman we are destined to be happy with, having first worn us down. But what can we do with the pink sunset over the cooling heavens, where there is silence and an unearthly peace? What can we do with immortal poems? They can't be eaten, drunk, or kissed. The moment speeds inexorably away, and though we wring our hands, Again, 
we are fated to walk on by and by. Just as a boy forgets his games and watches the girls bathing and knowing nothing about love is still tortured by mysterious desire. Just as once a slippery creature sliding through rank undergrowth roared when it realized its impotence, feeling on its back unformed wings. So age after age, how soon, O oh Lord, under nature and art's scalpel, our spirit screams, our flesh is exhausted, giving birth to the organ of the sixth sense. Шестое чувство. Прекрасно в нас влюбленное вино и добрый хлеб, что в печь для нас садится, и женщина, которую дано сперва измучившись нам насладиться. Но что нам делать с розовой зарей? Над холодеющими небесами, где тишина и неземной покой, что делать нам с бессмертными стихами? Не съесть, не выпить, не поцеловать, мгновение бежит неудержимо, и мы ломаем руки, но опять осуждены идти все мимо, мимо. Как мальчик, игры, позабыв свои, следит порой за девичьим купанием и, ничего не зная о любви, все ж мучится таинственным желанием. Как некогда в разросшихся хвощах Ревела от сознания бессилья Тварь скользкая, почуя на плечах Еще не появившиеся крылья, Так век за веком, скоро ли, Господь, Под скальпелем природы и искусства Кричит наш дух, Изнемогает плоть, рождая орган для шестого чувства. The focus of acmeism is on humanity and each individual's relation to the immediate reality of the surrounding world. This is reflected in the way in which Argumenov developed the psychological rather than the metaphysical element in his poetry. And he looked at his physical voyages as on some level, psychological ones of internal discovery. Eventually distant travel becomes a metaphor for spiritual pilgrimage. In poems like the word, Slova, he expresses a sense of spiritual impoverishment or alienation or at any rate, a sense of humankind's failure to realize its spiritual potential. The word was written in 1919 and is part of the Pillar of Fire, Ogneni Strop, a collection. The word is highly rhetorical. It alludes to several biblical texts. The last two lines read as follows. And like bees, in a deserted beehive, dead words smell bad. This striking image may be a metaphor for a breakdown of human communication. We'll now read the word. The word. On that day of old, when God inclined his face over the new world, then the word would stop the sun. The word would destroy towns. And the eagle did not flap its wings 
the stars huddled up to the moon in horror when the word, like a roseate flame, sailed in heaven's height. And there were numbers for lowly life, like domestic and yoked cattle, because an intelligent number conveys all shades of meaning. A grey-haired patriarch who had brought both good and evil under his sway, daring not to turn to sound, traced a number in the sand with his cane. But we forget that in the trials and tribulations of this world, only the word is radiant. And in the gospel, according to St. John, it is said that the word is God. It is we who have imposed on it the meagre limits of nature. And like bees in a deserted hive, dead words smell bad. Слово. Вон и день, когда над миром новым Бог склонял лицо свое, тогда солнце останавливали словом, словом разрушали города, и орел не взмахивал крылами, звезды жались в ужасе к луне. Если словно розовое пламя слово проплывало в вышине, а для низкой жизни были числа, как домашний подъеремный скот, потому что все оттенки смысла умное число передает. Патриарх седой. Себе под руку покоривший и добро, и зло, Не решаясь обратиться к звуку, Тростью на песке чертил число. Но забыли мы, что осиянно Только слово средь земных тревог, И в Евангелии от Иоанна сказано, что слово – это Бог. Мы ему поставили пределом скудные пределы естества. И как пчелы в улье опустелом дурно пахнут мертвые слова. Perhaps the most crucial distinguishing feature of Gumiyo's verse is the active ethical impulse it expresses. In Gumiyo's case, this means a conscious endeavor to live life to the full or to the bitter end, aspiring to the full blossoming of all physical and spiritual force. While Gumiyo proclaimed this, as an acmeous goal, it always remained a challenging ideal rather than something he managed to accomplish in practice. As a result, his poetry often deals with the sense of a life wasted and opportunity missed or denied and expresses feelings of alienation, displacement and inner disharmony. On the other hand, whatever the vicissitudes of life there is a stoical acceptance of the pain of reality. This active ethical element in Gumiyo's poetry is evident in the firm renunciation of suicide and also in the eloquent moral concern he expresses about how best to cope with living. This is illustrated by his poem, My Readers, Mai Chitatari, uh, published in the Pillar of Fire collection in 1921. Let me quote just four lines of this poem in English translation. But when bullets whistle around, when waves break the bows, I will teach them how not to fear. How not to fear, 
and to do what has to be done. Following the outbreak of the First World War and alone among established writers, Gumilyov at once volunteered for military service. It was no matter to him that he had been exempted uh, from military service in 1907 because of his astigmatism. He was motivated by the same striving for inner development, which had already impelled him towards both Africa and Acmeism. He enlisted in the cavalry as an ordinary soldier. In order to do so, at his own expense, he took lessons on the use of the sabre and lance. Being left-handed, he also applied for and was granted permission to fire from his left shoulder. Gumilyov served in uniform until the late spring of 1918 and saw a lot of action on the Eastern Front. Like Lermontov, Gumilyov distinguished himself in battle by exceptional courage. He was decorated for bravery three times, twice with the St. George Cross. Uh, these are the colors of uh, Gumilyov's military directions. On the left-hand side, uh, that is the order of uh, St. Stanislav in red and white. And then you will see the two, uh, the, the insignia of the two St. George's crosses in black and gold. In 1916, he wrote a poem which has often been considered uh, to be prophetic of his later execution by the Bolsheviks. I'm referring here to the workman, Rabochi, which was published in 1918 in the collection Bonfire, Gastior. This is a poem inspired by the First World War. That said, there is certainly a chilling presentiment of death caused by a bullet. As Nabokov said of Lermontov's poem, The Dream, Sony, this presents another vision of terrifying clarity. We'll now read The Workman. He stands in front of the red hot furnace a short old man. His blinking reddish eyelids give his calm look a submissive air. All his mates have gone to sleep. He alone is still awake. He is still busy casting the bullet that will part me from the earth. Finished and his eyes brighten up. He goes back home, the moon shines. His sleepy warm wife waits for him in their big bed. The bullet cast by him will whistle over the hoary foaming Dvina. The bullet cast by him will search out my chest. It has already come for me. I will fall in mortal anguish. I will see the past before my eyes. My blood will gush out onto the dry, dusty, crushed grass. And the Lord will pay me in full measure for my brief, bitter life. All this has been done by the short old man in the light grey blouse. Рабочий. Он стоит пред раскаленным горном, невысокий старый человек. Взгляд спокойный кажется покорным от прищура красноватых век. Все его товарищи заснули, только он один еще не спит. Все он занят отливанием пули, Что меня с землею разлучит. Кончил, и глаза повеселели. Возвращается, блестит луна. 
Дома ждет его в большой постели сонная и теплая жена. Пуля им отлитая просвищет над седою вспененной двиной. Пуля им отлитая отыщет грудь мою. Она пришла за мной. Упаду, смертельно затаскую, Прошлое увижу наяву. Кровь ключом захлещет На сухую, пыльную и мятую траву. И Господь воздаст мне полной мерой За недолгий мой и горький век. Это сделал в блузе светло-серой невысокий старый человек. Gumilyov spent the last two weeks of June 1917 in London. There, amongst others, uh, through uh, Boris Anrep, the mosaicist and close friend of Akhmatova. He met such luminaries as Roger Fry, G.K. Chesterton, Yeats, and Aldous Huxley. The next stage of his journey took him to Paris. He remained there through the rest of 1917, serving as an administrative assistant to the military commissar of the provisional government. While in Paris, uh, Gumilyov paid persistent court to a certain Yelena Duboucher whose attitude to his advances is recorded in his posthumously published cycle for a blue star, Xenia Zvizdier. In January 1918, Gumilyov returned to London, hoping to reach the Mesopotamian front. When this proved impossible, he worked for a while in the ciphers department of the Russian government committee. By April 1918, though, all funds for his maintenance were exhausted and he was ordered home to Russia. Back home in revolutionary uh, Petrograd, Gumenyov threw himself into literary life with unrestrained enthusiasm. After his divorce uh, from Akhmatova in the summer of 1918, he hurriedly married the poet Balmont's uh, stepdaughter, Anna Engelhardt. She bore him a daughter, Yelena, in April 1919. But by November 1919, day-to-day -day existence in cold and hungry Petrograd had become so difficult that the family were dispatched to Gumilyov's mother in Bezhetsk in Tver province. Gumilyov's son Liev, who was being raised by Gumilyov's mother, also lived there. The result was that Gumilyov lived apart from his family until May 1921. In 1918, he embarked on the publication of his sixth book of verse, Bonfire, Gastur, and also his version of Oriental poetry, The Porcelain Pavilion, Fafovery a Pavilion. He was also commissioned uh, to produce the African cycle of his poems, The Tent, Chatur, and published his translation of the Epic of Gilgamesh. By early 1919, the acute paper shortage forced him to channel his energies elsewhere. He spent a great deal of time editing and translating for Gorky's uh, World Literature Series. In addition to this, Gumilyov taught the theory, history and practice of poetry, often lecturing several times a week and devoting considerable attention to a coterie of younger writers. He seemed indefatigable too as a member of numerous literary cultural committees, which were then vital to the very physical survival of the intellectual community. In 1921, he was elected chairman of the Petrograd branch of the Russian Union of Poets. Though it's difficult to see how he found time for original work, let alone alleged political conspiracy, this was also a time of tremendous uh, creative, uh, creative activity. He produced much new drama, the first cantos of a narrative work, Poem of the Beginning, some lyrical poems, 
sometimes in an experimental vein. And above all, the magnificent poetry that would make up his collection, The Pillar of Fire, Ognini Stolp. There was no doubt that when he was arrested in August 1921, he was at the height of his powers and full of fresh creative plans. In terms of uh, Gumilyov's poetic achievement, I would not wish uh, to dismiss the value of his earlier work. However, the poetry which he wrote between 1918 and 1921, particularly that in the volumes Bonfire and The Pillar of Fire, was of unsurpassed quality. The Pillar of Fire was his last book of poems. It was published in the three weeks between his arrest and execution in August 1921. And it was distinguished by a staggering range and intensity of spiritual searching and a new emotional and intellectual depth. This was matched by the remarkable technical accomplishment of a poet who had been developing exponentially throughout his career. I've already mentioned the poem, My Readers, but I cannot leave the Pillar of Fire collection without mentioning two other poems. The collection opens with the famous poem, Memory, Pamyat. At one level, this is an autobiographical account of some of the key events or stages in Gumilyov's development, but it's also a very good example of the greatly increased depth and complexity of his last collection. The second poem is The Tram That Lost Its Way. This poem, which was written in 1919, ranks as one of Gumilyov's greatest achievements and as one of the greatest poems of the 20th century in any language. In Gumilyov's own words, the verses came to him suddenly after a sleepless night spent at a card game. He wrote all 15 stanzas in 40 minutes without any editing and was himself surprised at his creation. The poem could be described as a vision. It's to be understood on many levels and has many meanings. I can only outline the poem's most obvious superficial meaning. The author jumps on to the tram of revolution, which is moving with enormous speed and from which it's impossible to get off. The tram is losing its way in space and time. It swings between Europe Africa and Asia, between spiritual heights and executions. Eventually, it reaches Russia. And Gumilyov then gives us three landmarks which no revolution can destroy. These are Pushkin, who wrote The Captain's Daughter, where the code of honor was expressed. Even its epigraph reads, take care of honor from your youth. The bronze horseman, a symbol of statesmanship and a window to Europe. And thirdly, St. Isaac's Cathedral, a symbol of orthodoxy, where the author orders a prayer to be said for the salvation of his beloved Mashenka, who could also symbolize Russia, and orders a funeral service for himself in another presentiment of his own violent death. We'll now read this poem. The Tram That Lost Its Way. I was walking along an unfamiliar street when I suddenly heard the cawing of crows the ringing of a lute and distant thunder, a tram was flying past. How I jumped on its step was a mystery to me. It left a fiery trail in the air, even in broad daylight. It rushed 
like a dark winged storm. It lost its way in the abyss of time. Driver, stop, stop the tram immediately. Too late. We have already rounded a wall, hurtled through a palm grove, thundered over three bridges across the Neva, the Nile and the Seine. And in a flash past the window, an old beggar, of course, the very one who died a year ago in Beirut, threw us a searching glance. Where am I? So languidly, so anxiously, my heart beats in answer. You see the station where you can buy a ticket for the India of the spirit. A signboard, the letters flooded with blood spell out green grocer. I know that instead of cabbages and swedes, they sell dead heads here. In a red shirt with a face like an udder, the executioner cut off my head as well. It lay together with the others at the very bottom of the slippery box. A wooden fence by the side street, a three windowed house and a gray lawn. Driver, stop, stop the tram immediately. Mashinka, you lived and sang here. Wove a rug for me, your betrothed. Where now are your body and voice? Can it be that you are dead? How you moaned in your chamber, while I in a powdered wig went to present myself to the Empress, never to see you again. Now I understand. Our freedom is only a light penetrating from another world. People and shadows stand by the entrance to the zoological garden of the planets. And a familiar sweet wind rises suddenly beyond the bridge, a rider's hand in a mailed glove and two hooves of his horse fly towards me. St. Isaac's is carved on high, the true stronghold of orthodoxy. There I will order prayers to be said for Marshinka's health and a funeral service for me. But still, my heart is forever gloomy. It's difficult to breathe. It's painful to live. Mashinka, I never thought that one could feel such love and such sadness. Заблудившийся трамвай. Шел я по улице незнакомой, и вдруг услышал в вороне грай, и звоны лютни, и дальние громы. Передо мною летел трамвай. Как я вскочил на его подножку, было загадкою для меня. В воздухе огненную дорожку он оставлял и при свете дня. Мчался он бурей, темной, крылатой. Он заблудился в бездне времен. Остановите вагон, вожатый! Остановите сейчас вагон! Поздно. Уж мы обогнули стену. Мы проскочили сквозь рощу пальм. Через Неву, через Нил и Сену мы прогремели по трем мостам. И, промелькнув у оконной рамы, бросил нам след пытливый взгляд нищий старик. Конечно, тот самый, что умер в Бейруте год назад. Где я? Так томно и так тревожно сердце мое стучит в ответ. Видишь вокзал, на котором можно в Индию духа 
купить билет. Вывеска. Кровью налитые буквы гласят зеленая. Знаю, тут вместо капусты и вместо брюквы мертвые головы продают. В красной рубашке с лицом, как вымя, голову срезал палач и мне. Она лежала вместе с другими в ящике с польском на самом дне. А в переулке забор дощатый, дом в три окна и серый газон. Остановите вагон вожатый, остановите сейчас вагон. Машенька, ты здесь жила и пела, мне жениху коверткала. Где же сейчас твой голос и тело? Может ли быть, что ты умерла? Как ты стонала в своей светлице? Я же с напудренной косой Шел представляться императрице И не увиделся вновь с тобой. Понял теперь я, наша свобода только оттуда бьющий свет. Люди и тени стоят у входа в зоологический сад планет. И сразу ветер знакомый и сладкий. И за мостом летит на меня всадника длань в железной перчатке и два копыта его коня. Верной твердынью православия врезан Исаакий в вышине. Там отслужу я молебен о здравии Машеньки. И панихиду по мне. И все ж навеки сердце угрюмо. И трудно дышать, и больно жить. Машенька, я никогда не думал, Что можно так любить и грустить. Nikolai Gumilyov was arrested on the 7th of August, 1921. To judge by the surviving record of his interrogation, Gumilyov's most serious crime was an admission that had the Kronstadt revolt of March 1921 spread to Petrograd, he would have been prepared to fight on the side of the rebels. His, quote, guilt was otherwise attested only by the flimsy allegations of one or two shadowy agent provocateur. In the aftermath of the ruthless and bloody suppression of the Kronstadt rebellion in 1921 by the Bolshevik regime, a sensible person could be forgiven for thinking that the safest course was to adapt one's behavior to fit the times. However, this was not Gumilyov style. Gumilyov throughout his life lived according to a strict code of chivalry and honor. And to the very end of his life, he remained true to his principles. There is no doubt that his constitutional inability to deviate from his chosen path, which was that of moral principle and honor, helped to seal his fate. The details of his case were described in an article published in the magazine Novimir in 1987. 
This article contains a short note by Terekhov, the senior deputy procurator general of the USSR, who in 1986 was given the task of reviewing all the material on Gumilyov's case in the state archives. Terekhov writes that Gumilyov's crime had consisted in not informing the Soviet authorities that he had been invited to join an anti-Soviet officer's plot, the so-called Tagansev conspiracy. As Terekhov put it, the principles of the code of chivalry and officer's honor did not allow him to become an informant. On the 24th of August, 1921, Gumilyov was sentenced to death. He was shot together with 60 of the other so-called uh, Tagansev conspirators. The executions were carried out in a forest outside Petrograd in the early morning of 26 August, 1921. The exact dates only became known in 2014. The bodies were buried in an unmarked communal grave. Uh, the next three slides I'll show um, display the different sites where it's thought that the executions may have been carried out. Uh, the first is near the Berngardovka station. That's the, um, the woods near Berngardovka station, the most like, thought to be the most likely place. This is where Akhmatova thought the execution had taken place. And thirdly, this is um, the headland, the fox's nose, Lysinos uh, headland, uh, again, thought to be a possible candidate. Uh, Nikolai Gumilyov was the first uh, prominent man of letters to be murdered by the new regime, a victim not of Stalinism, but of Lenin's red terror. Bloch's own death on the 7th of August, 1921, the same day on which Gumilyov was arrested, was shrouded in mystery. No one quite seems to know what he died of. We now know that Lenin personally ordered that a visa should not be issued for Bloch to get treatment in Finland. It's fair to say that these three events, the brutal suppression of the Kronstadt uprising, the death of Bloch, and the execution of Gumilyov and the other Tagansev conspirators had a marked effect on the political and cultural atmosphere. It became, it became even more oppressive and suffocating. By 1923, uh, Gumilyov's works were proscribed in Russia and those close to him began to suffer. Aliyev, his son by Akhmatova, and later an outstanding historian, ethnographer, and cultural philosopher, was repeatedly arrested uh, because of his parentage and spent more than a full decade in prison camps. Gumilyov's second wife and daughter died of cold and starvation in 1942 during the siege of Leningrad. Akhmatova herself was treated harshly. None of her books were published between 1921 and 1940, and the 1940 edition of her poems was almost immediately banned. But despite the banning of his work, Gumilyov's poetry continued to be read in secret and was studied and reprinted in the West. On the centenary anniversary of Gumilyov's birth in 1986, cautious republication of his poetry at home became one of the first signals of Gorbachev's policy of glasnost. Publication figures since then clearly suggest that he's now one of Russia's most popular poets. An incorrigible romantic, vagrant adventurer, conquistador, and a tireless seeker of dangers and strong impressions. That was the way he was. That was how one of his contemporaries, the historian of the arts and critic, Erich Golobach, described Gumilyov. Golobach commented that as children, many of us devour books about adventure and travel and then went on as follows. 
However, almost no one lives a life of heroic adventure. Almost no one is inspired to translate into life the dangerous ideas and undertake expeditions to different parts. He did this. He lived as if he was 16 all his life. Love, death, and poetry. At 16, we know these things are the most wonderful things in the world. Then we forget about them. Routine trifles of daily life kill off our romantic dreams. We forget. But he did not forget. He did not forget them until he died. Uh, the Russian scholar Vyacheslav uh, Sevolodovich Ivanov compared um, Gumilyov's poetic path to the explosion of a star that, quotes, suddenly flares so brightly before its destruction and emits a flood of light across the surrounding spaces. His achievement at 35 was arguably at least the equal of Akhmatova's at the same age, possibly even of Mandelstam's. As with the greatest 19th century poets, Alexander Pushkin, shot in a duel aged 37, and Mikhail Lermontov, also killed in a duel at the age of 26, one can only wonder in awe and regret at what might have been achieved over the next half a lifespan. All of this makes the sudden death of Gumilyov at 35 seem especially wasteful. His premature death, like that of Lermontov at 26, leaves an overwhelming sense of unfulfilled potential, the thwarted promise of still greater things to come. The symbolist poet Vyacheslav Ivanov used a particular phrase to describe his erstwhile acmeist adversary. This was Nasha Pagibshaya Velikaya Nadezhda, our great hope who has died. I think that this is a fitting epitaph uh, for, to the great acmeist poet and brilliant poet of the Silver Age, Nikolai Gumilyov. The last poem on our list is simply entitled Last Poem. This poem is believed to have been found in Gumilyov's prison cell after his execution on the 26th of August, 1921, and was published in the West. Although its authenticity cannot be vouchsafed, it is an extremely powerful and moving poem. If indeed it was written by Gumilyov, it was the last poem he wrote. We'll now read this poem. At this evening hour, at this sunset hour, like a winged caravel, Petrograd floats by. And above the reddening disk, your angel burns on the obelisk, like the sun's younger brother. I am not afraid. I am calm. I am a sailor, poet, and warrior. I will not yield to the executioner. Let them brand me with shame. I know I am paying for freedom with a clot of black blood. Yet I know that for my verses and my valor, for my sonnets and my sword, at this evening hour, at this sunset hour, my stern city, like a winged caravel, will take me home. В час вечерний, в час заката, каравелою крылатой проплывает Петроград, и горит над рдяным диском. Ангел твой на обелиске, словно солнце, младший брат. Я не трушу, я спокоен, я моряк, поэт и воин, не поддамся палачу. Пусть клеймят клеймом позорным, знаю, 
сгустком крови черным за свободу я плачу, за стихи и за отвагу, за сонеты и за шпагу знаю строгий город мой. В час вечерний, в час заката, Каравеллы у крылатой отвезет меня домой. And now, uh, to conclude our evening, um, we'll listen to Nikolai Gumilyov himself. Uh, Rafi will shortly play a recording or a fragment of a recording from 1918, in which uh, Gumilyov will read part of his poem, Osian, Autumn. Thus, a hundred years after his death, the voice of a poet will call to us. Uh, Lucy will first read an English translation by John Cobley of the relevant uh, fragment. In the fragment of the recording that remains, Gumilyov starts reading in the middle of a sentence. So Lucy will read uh, the two preceding lines in the translation so that you can make sense of the rest of the sentence as spoken uh, by Gumilyov. Uh, Lucy. Alongside me runs my shaggy red-haired dog who is dearer to me than even a brother and who will be remembered after she has died. The hoof taps speed up dust covers everything. It is difficult to chase a horse of pure Ab Arabian blood. I may have to sit down panting on a rock that is broad and flat and marvel vacantly at the orange red sky and listen vacantly to the wind screaming piercingly. <laughs> Thanks, Rafi. Um, that is the uh, end of our um, performance, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very happy to um, to answer any questions or uh, any points you'd like to raise. Thanks, David. A really um, moving and sort of noble uh, story, I think. Um, please do uh, put questions in the chat if you have any. Um, very uh, attentive audience, so thank you. Um, uh, could I thank, um, in the, waiting for questions to come, if there are any, uh, could I thank Philip McDonough, who I believe is here, uh, very much for drawing to my attention the play Gondola. Um, Philip, thank you so much for um, sending it to me in the post. I'm awaiting arrival, and I will devour it on, um, on receipt. Um, you'll appreciate that in a sort of 45-minute, 50-minute presentation, one can't cover every aspect, but I will also be frank, I hadn't appreciated um, quite how many plays um, Gumilyov had written. And indeed that play was um, performed in his lifetime at uh, Rostov Nadonu, and indeed performed uh, posthumously uh, before uh, being banned from further performance. But it was very interesting to hear about that. And I'm looking forward immensely to um, to reading um, your translation. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. And <laughs> <laughs> um, what do we know about Gondola's mission, uh, not <laughs> Gumilyov's mission um, in London and Paris? You know, I've heard it said that in that period, 1917, 1918, he was trying to make contacts, you know, of some kind that might have been of value to people 
back in Petrograd? Um, well, I'm aware of the cultural contacts. He was um, invited or, or mixed with the certain of the Bloomsbury circle, and obviously through uh, Baris Anrep, who was um, uh, close to Ahmadova. Uh, he met those various luminaries I mentioned, uh, but on the literary cultural circuit. But I, I'm not aware if he was trying to pursue more if you like practical kinds of contacts, which could be a benefit to, to people back home in, um, in the Soviet Union. I'm not sure how good his English was. Um, he, he read those works I mentioned as a school child in, in translation, um, but he must have had, it must have been a, an incredible period to be, um, to, be, to be meeting people like Yeats or Aldous Huxley. Um, Roger Fry at a time when the, I mean, the, the whole of the Western world, as well as Russia, w was going through this tremendously vibrant and, and fertile creative period. It's, I, I think we should actually do more um, in the UK or in English speaking countries to celebrate the, the Silver Age because it's, it's so rich. And it's, I mean, my prime interest, as you probably have surmised, is the written word, it's poetry. Um, but ballet, music, and painting, it's phenomenal. Um, and I do, th I do think Russia, frankly, the, the, the output, if I can put it that way, in the 19th century alone, ranks among the world's greatest cultural achievement. But I think also the, the 20th century, um, the Silver Age also ranks up there, I would, um, and it's impossible to um, to compare the quality. They're they're so different, but it was that um, that sense of excitement and innovation. I mean, what you'll have surmised why I personally like the um, the Acmeists is it's the respect for the tradition. It's not they wanted just to do what had been done before, but they were very conscious of the tradition, the fantastic tradition they inherited. And wanted to take it forward. And um, I, I find those three, Mandelstam, Akhmatova, and Gumilyov together, I think there's a word periklitschka uh, to, to describe the continuous conversation they had. <laughs> what touched me so much about Gumilyov and Akhmatova after a disastrous marriage, I mean, one sympathizes with both at the human level. But what, what I find very interesting is they carried on to their mutual benefit as poets uh, to. To, to engage with each other in a civilized manner. I think that's that's fantastic. That's not quite the answer to your original question, but anyway. <laughs> Why do you think this period was so fruitful culturally? I mean, is there a kind of special conditions that created this sort of crucible? Well, it's a very good question because, I mean, a, a trite point is that when um, societies where there's, a, if you like, polit political problems or a revolution, etc. And it's uh, writing poetry is literally a, a matter of life and death as it has been in, in Russia. I mean, the 19th century as well as the 20th century. But what is interesting about the Silver Age, it started before, it started before the First World War, it started before the revolution. So it's very interesting to um, to surmise if there was a, a specific um, social or economic trigger, um, it seems to have been a natural spontaneous development. Um, obviously, the, the Russian intelligentsia were, were highly cultivated and um, highly literate, and were, were very conscious of the fantastic um, tradition there was, not just in Russia, but in, in Western Europe and elsewhere. I mean, what is very interesting about Gumilyov is in, his... Um, his interest in, in Africa, I mean, certain parts of Africa, obviously, but Abyssinia and Somalia. Um, I mean, his Soviet detractors portrayed him as a kind of white imperialist, but that was not at all what he was like. He was really fascinated by the cultural diversity he found there. So in that sense, he was way ahead of his time. Yeah, I think it's probably quite easy to read some of his poems these days with a modern eye for, you know, racial race relations and think, okay, well, he's being a little bit sort of insensitive here. But I think it was, it's quite important to remember that he was 
one of the very, very small number of Russians who ever went to Africa. And yes. Of his own eyes, right? Yes, yeah. Hmm. Um, I'm conscious that we are probably running a little over time, but I, if there's any more questions, please do uh, come out with them um, sooner rather than later. Um, and again, I'll, I'll mention that we can, all, all of these, uh, actually, Ahmad, that we haven't covered yet, but um, Mandelstam and uh, Block and Yesenian are all yes. um, sort of featured in this uh, casual series of of readings and um, biographies that we've um, been having uh, the last year and a half and and they're all on YouTube if you do search up just Pushkin House block or Nerva uh, um, you'll, you'll manage to find that um, and do we have any sort of uh, is there a chance that we'll get an Ahmad of a evening? I think I think Lucy and Ella and I have discussed this I think <laughs> Ahmad of a having mentioned her so much in the last two talks um, I think that that's a must for the autumn, and it was a natural development. I mean, we've not, we hadn't pre-planned this. It's been a sort of spontaneously emerging series of talks, um, and, and this is just the start. Um, one hopes, um, but we try to um, we try to link the poems to the the life of the poet, and um, to, for for an English audience perhaps who haven't uh, discovered Russian poetry, it's an incredibly rich. Um, cultural world that awaits them. And the, the language needn't be um, th that great a barrier. I mean, this is the immense importance of translation um, and taking care with translation to be true to the, um, the spirit of the original and the text as far as, well, as, as is possible. It's it, cruci excruciatingly difficult to translate um, uh, Russian poetry, of course. I should say, by the way, that the translator of eight of those, uh, of seven of those uh, nine poems we read is Richard McCain. I simply translated the first uh, choice and the last one, last poem. Richard, who is a, a brilliant translator of Mandelstam, Akhmatova, and, and other Russian poets, including Gumilyov, um, we, we've used his, his translations. And indeed, in the previous, in the previous talks, the, um, the list of poems with the text, the Russian text and the, and the, the translations, that makes it very clear. And um, I'm very happy for everyone who's attended to have copies of those, um, those poems and to, to, to study them, um, the, the translation and the original. Yeah, we'll set those out. Um, it doesn't look like there are any further questions, so I'd like to just thank all of our uh, audience. Yes, yeah. Uh, Having a uh, nervous switch. No. Yeah. No? Um, thank you very much, Roy. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you, Allah. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, uh, David, as well. Um, it's been you know, uh, a great and really very pleased that we've had these uh, ones, and I hope they will continue. Yeah, we can go back to probably having things in person. We're going to try and make sure that people who aren't able to attend in person can still watch live uh, from, from the comfort of their own homes. because. We've, we've uh, as we've seen today, we have a, a fairly sizable international contingent. You know, it's really great to be able to sort of connect, keep, keep connecting with these people. Thank you, Rafi. Oleg, Oleg has his hand up. Oh, oh yes. Uh, well, Oleg, if you want to say something, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. okay next thank time you. <laughs> thank you <laughs> i didn't know alieg was here <laughs> right. you were sitting in the dark <laughs> where, where is he i couldn't see him he's <laughs> o, o dot f e o dot f e at aol dot co dot uk hmm. yeah he's where he's he's giving us a wave and a thumbs up uh, rather than a cheers Okay, fantastic. But thank you, um, Rafi, for being such an impeccable host, as always. No worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, well, thanks again, and I'll um, speak to you and see you hopefully soon again. Um, thanks a lot.